As I was saying, it's really good to see you. It's good to be here. Just want to add my thanks to what Stuart's already said, um, to the folks who um, really welcomed visitors yesterday who were part of the induction service. It was just really beautiful, really beautiful. And we just thank you. Um, as Stuart's already said, we have prayed separately and then together about um, what to what to preach on, what to teach on um, as our first preach series um, at People's Church. And separately, uh, we felt really led to the book of Philippians. It's actually a letter um, written to a church 2,000 years ago, but you are going to see how relevant it is still how special it is, why it is part of scriptures, why it is still read today, why it's so precious and inspiring. And I would say it's probably the most encouraging book in the whole of scripture. I know that there's loads of books that we could, some people have their go-to verses and everything, but so many of them are found in the letter to the Philippian church. And I don't think it's much of a surprise that both Alpha and Christianity Explored. Has anyone done Alpha or Christianity Explored? Anyone done one of them? Coolio. Um, they both use the book of Philippians as like a first introduction to Bible study for new Christians. But I have to say it's probably one of my favorite books in the Bible. And no matter how many decades, and I have been a Christian for decades, no matter how many decades, it continues to be so deeply, so movingly important in a Christian's life. There are so many go-to passages, and I'm going to share some of them. The first one is from chapter two, and this is known to be like one of the first Christian songs. And it's inspired plenty since and plenty of contemporary um, Christian worship songs are based on this amazing chapter, these amazing verses from chapter two. And if you can memorize them, I would say go for it, because just like the early Christians and why it was written for the early Christians, it helps and reminds Christians about who Jesus is, his life, his death, his resurrection why he is God, <laughs> why we should worship him as God. It is so important. And I'm just going to read it out. It'll be on several of these um, slides. So powerful. Just like that song that we just, that we just sung, which I think is probably inspired by passages like this in Philippians. Jesus, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and he was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is our God. <laughs> this is our Jesus. This is whom we worship and we adore and we are unashamed to sing about, we're unashamed to declare, which amazing testimony already that we've heard about sharing this and God giving us opportunities to talk about his precious son, Jesus, because not only does God the Father love his son, but we do as well. Thank you, Lord. But also the book of Philippians is full of wisdom for daily living, living by faith through the ups and downs of life, which we're all going to face, aren't we? We're all going through. And here's some beautiful wisdom from chapter four, which I bet loads of you recognize. It's on the next slide. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. 
then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything that we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. How amazing is that wisdom? How amazing. How many times have you turned to those verses if you've known them like I have for decades and decades? These verses that encourage us to pray, the power of prayer, encourage us to take our worries to God. We need to be reminded to do that, don't we? <laughs> God loves us. He loves us so much. And these verses encourage us to seek God's peace. It is possible to have peace even when we're going through difficulties. I'm sure I'm not the only one that has received these verses in texts from a good Christian friend. I hope you have. And maybe it's a practice that we should just start <laughs> texting each other with amazing verses. But I'm sure I'm not the only one that's already received that at just the right time when I needed to hear it the most. To trust God, to pray. But one of the most beautiful things about the letter to the Philippians that you'll, you'll see as we go through it is the personality and the character of the guy who wrote it, the Apostle Paul, along with his friend Timothy. But the Apostle Paul, who wrote loads of letters in the New Testament that have now become authoritative scripture for us Christians. And his love for Jesus and for the church shines through in everything that he says. I find his example so inspiring, but also so challenging. Here in chapter 3, is something that is both inspiring and challenging. This is Paul's approach to life and living by faith. I press on, he says, to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. One thing I do, forgetting what is past and straining towards what is ahead, I press on, I press on, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. How epic are those verses? How inspiring, how challenging. How many times have we been dragged down by our past? I'm happy to kind of like put myself there and say, I have. Or struggled with doubt or insecurity about ourselves or about the future or even about God. How many times have we been kept back from enjoying our relationship with Jesus and freedom in the Holy Spirit because of anxiety or self-condemnation or just lack of confidence in life? And Paul says, I am choosing, I am choosing to forget the past. It's a choice that we have to make. I'm choosing to forget the past. I am looking forward. I'm going to keep going. And I'm going to keep going and I'm going to keep going, even when it's tough, because the hope I have in Jesus is so worth it. And you say, amen, with the Apostle Paul. Amen. Jesus is so worth it. Encouragement. Next slide. Encouragement helps us face the challenges in life. Encouragement is even in the word. It gives us courage. It's part of the meaning of the word. It can help us when we feel down or we feel like giving up. You can do it. Come on, we're rooting for you. We're on the finishing line cheering you on. Or better still, is it not more encouraging to hear people say, I'm running with you. I'm running this race with you right beside you. Now, this is true for loads of aspects of life. I've got a friend who's obsessed with her Fitbit and getting her steps in. Um... So you need encouragement for doing that, even if it's through like a, a device, like a Fitbit. But actually, it's most especially true about our walk of faith with Jesus. And I'm so thankful for the people in my life that spur me on in my faith. People like Stuart and Harry and Helena, who are here today, who hopefully you'll get to know a little bit, um, are grown-up kids. I shouldn't probably still call them kids, but they are. People like Jill, my spiritual director, which sounds like a very super grand thing to have a spiritual director. But she's just a friend who 
sacrifices time for me to go and meet with her, to talk about what's going on in my life and in my ministry. She prays before I turn up and she asks God to give me a word. And then we talk through things and pretty much at the end of the session, she'll then hand me the word that she has been thinking of. And it will tie in so amazingly with what we've been talking about. It's so encouraging to have someone who sacrifices their time like that for you. I'm thankful for so many people like that in my life. It's not just the big things like changing, like going into ministry, which is what Jill has helped me with. Um, but it's also the daily things like struggling with my own character. I'm prepared to admit, just like all of us, we have struggles with our character. But also struggling with relationships. And to have friends who are prepared to love you enough to say things that you need to hear. Sometimes we don't want to. Sometimes it hurts when people say stuff to us. But how encouraging to have friends that are prepared to do that. Now, the book of Philippians is full of encouragement like this. And it's good to know that Paul loves the Philippian church, that he's saying this out of love. Even the things that are pretty tough to hear, he's saying it out of love. And today we're just going to look briefly at the first 11 verses in chapter one. They are amazing. They are like a kapow, good start to a letter. I would want to receive a letter like this. And we are going to read that it's on the screen. And you'll notice that the version, if for you who know these scriptures pretty well, you'll see that it's a bit different. It's from the New Living Translation. And, and I kind of did it deliberately because for folks that know them really well, that they can just trot it off. They kind of pretty much know it. Sometimes it's good to hear it in a different version. So on the screen is um, Philippians 1, 1 to 11 in the New Living Translation. But if you've got your Bibles there, don't worry if it's a different version. It doesn't matter. It's still the word of God. And we're going to read this through together. I have to take my glasses off. This letter is from Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus. I'm writing to you. That's Paul speaking there. To all of God's holy people in Philippi who belong to Christ Jesus, including the church leaders and the deacons, may God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray, I make my requests for you, all of you, with joy. For you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it's finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. So it's right that I should feel as I do about all of you, for you have a special place in my heart. You share with me the special favor of God both in my imprisonment and in defending and confirming the truth of the good news. God knows how much I love you and long for you with the tender compassion of Christ Jesus. I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. For I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. For this will bring much glory and praise to God. This is the word of the Lord. Now the Apostle Paul, where are we up to? So yeah, brilliant. The Apostle Paul wrote this letter in prison in Rome. That's what most people think anyway, near the end of his life. Once Paul became a follower of Jesus, everything changed for him. He gave his whole life to sharing the good news about Jesus with everyone he met, everywhere he went. And it landed him in prison quite a few times. And one of the times he was in prison was in Philippi, which is where the Philippians are from um, and where... Paul is writing to. 
And he went to Philippi, and I love this story in Acts. I think you've done a wee bit of study in Acts, haven't you? So you find the story in Acts chapter 16. Paul and his friends go to Philippi, which is in Macedonia, because Paul had a dream when they were praying. I love this. I love this. Um, when they were praying about where they should go next, um, and they were thinking, should we go here? Should we go here? Paul had a dream about a man from Macedonia who was desperately pleading with Paul in this dream to come and share the news of Jesus with him. So based on this dream, what faith they had. Based on this dream, they go to Macedonia. And the place that they land, really, is Philippi. But funnily enough, the first person who gives their life to Jesus isn't a man. It's a woman called Lydia, a Greek woman who they meet out at a place where people used to pray. And they share the good news about Jesus, they share the gospel, they share the story of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection with these people and Lydia who longs to know God and who is trying to worship God but she doesn't know Jesus she hears the story of Jesus and she is blown away and she gives her life she puts her faith and her trust in Jesus and from her and from her household the church in Philippi begins and the Philippians who Paul is writing to here who he had such an essential part of how they came to know Jesus, this is how the connection starts, through Paul and his friends going and Lydia being the first person whose heart is stirred and gives a life to Jesus. Now, I know a little bit about the story of People's Church, and I love it. I love stories of beginnings because beginnings then grow and change and become something else. It's exciting because God is always on the move, isn't he? God gives us faith, and then he says, I'm not just giving you faith, you are going to see so many different things. And so I love reading Acts because it tells us so much about what God has done, but the fact that he will continue to do this. Paul wrote the letter with his friend and co-worker in the gospel, Timothy. And Timothy, Paul sees him like a son, but also a brother, somebody who he has seen grow in the faith, somebody who is loyal and loving and is prepared to take risks for his friend Paul and prepared to stay with Paul even when other people have deserted him. How valuable are those kind of friends? Very valuable. Christian friendship is so special. Christians, just as much as anyone else, can really super duper let you down. Sometimes it's kind of worse, isn't it, when it's Christians? Yeah. Um, but it is so worth developing these friendships. At our induction yesterday, so many of you were there, but we had people that we have known, family, who I've known forever, my sister's there, um, people that we have known for decades, people from Scotland and churches in Wales, people from our church in Warrington, Hillcliffe, people from Hull in Chester, um, Reverend Jane Mottram from St. Mary's and her husband, Trevor, they were there. Um, Jane prayed for us. Friends, old and new, people that have been with us through things, <laughs> many things. Times where we have helped people when they've been struggling and people that have helped us when we've struggled as well. What a blessing Christian friendship is. What potential there is when we love each other. And as we start serving at People's Church, that's what we want. We want spiritual friendship. We want love. We want Christian friendship. And we want to offer that as well. I hope that over this next season, you might already have Timothy's and Paul's in your life. But I hope that we have more. Because there is more, isn't there? There is so much more when we love each other. Now, Paul is an amazing dude. He is so full of faith in Jesus. And even though Paul is in prison, he chooses to be encouraged. He chooses to forget what is past. And he chooses to be encouraged, even when he's in prison, even when he's potentially facing death. He chooses to be encouraged rather than given to despair. He takes most encouragement from the certainty that his hope is in Jesus and that this hope can never be taken from him, no matter what. And he chooses to think about the blessings in his life, 
like his dear friend Timothy and the people that he loves at Philippi, the Philippian church, he chooses to focus on this rather than on his difficulties. And in verse 3, he writes to the Philippians, I think this might be um, on the next slide. Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Are there people like that that you feel like that about? Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Paul is thankful and encouraged and filled with joy when he thinks of the Philippian Christians because he saw them become Christians. He saw their faith grow. And not only that, he's seen them follow his example. He's seen them be prepared to take risks in sharing the good news with the people around them. And he loves that. Being put in prison because he loves the gospel and he wants to share it hasn't made him get all shy and timid. No, he wants to keep sharing the gospel and he loves seeing people do it. I loved your testimony, even if you, <laughs> you didn't share it. It's still your testimony. It's so incredibly profound, so wonderful. Doesn't it not give you joy when you hear people taking those opportunities to share Jesus and thinking, what is going to happen because of this? What is happening in the heavenlies? What's happening in the kingdom of God when we choose to share with joy the good news about Jesus? Amazing. Paul says in verse six, I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. I, this is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. I, I have memorized this in the NIV, but I've memorized it. I love it. I let it come into my head a lot because I love this certainty and I believe it. I believe that Jesus Christ will return for his church. I believe that he will put all things right. I believe that what God has begun in me and in you through faith, he will carry on to completion. And Paul doesn't just believe this for himself. He believes this for all his brothers and sisters in Christ, the ones that he knows now, but us, because <laughs> he knows that God is faithful. Paul had so many reasons to doubt God's love for him. But he doesn't, because he knows who God is. Why does God let his children go through difficult things? That is a question that we're often, all of us, at some point or other in our life, we, we're tortured by it. Paul ends up in prison. He's beaten, he's persecuted, he's rejected, he's deserted. But he chooses to believe, and he absolutely believes that God is faithful. God is good. God is steadfast. God is loving. He chooses to see beyond prison and beyond fear, which I think is something that we all need to do, to see beyond fear in this life. He's looking forward to a day when he will see Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. And so am I. <laughs> that joy and that certainty is for all of us. Paul says in Romans 8, you know what? Nothing can take this certainty away from me. I'll read some of the verses. I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I need to hear a hallelujah <laughs> or whatever you say. <laughs> God is faithful and God is good. It's true for Paul, for me, for you, for all those who love Jesus, for people's church, for St. Mary's, for people who don't know Jesus yet in Partington, people like Lydia who are longing to worship God in spirit and in truth, but they don't know how yet, and they just need somebody to share Jesus with them. Satan is real. Jesus talks about the devil. He was tempted by the devil. Satan wants to take away our certainty and our peace and our trust in God. He wants to steal yours too. And he will if he can. He'll just keep trying. He's not polite, let's face it. Even now, Satan is tempting me with negative thoughts. You're an imposter. You're a woman. <laughs> Who do you think you are? 
trying to lead a church. I'm laughing, but to be honest, this has been quite a big issue for me for a long time. And if I listen to Satan, I won't serve God. I won't trust God. I won't trust in the promises of God. I won't be free to serve God or to worship him in spirit and in truth. Our peace and our security and our hope can only be taken from us if we let it. Because it is all based and grounded on God's faithfulness, God's character, God's love. God began a beautiful work of faith in you when you first believed. And he is faithful and able and willing and longing to carry that to completion until you meet your Lord Jesus face to face. Paul's love for the church shines through. Look at verses seven and eight. I'm, I think I'm trying to fit a bit too much in. I might have to jack it all in in a minute. <laughs> but I want to mention this, verses seven and eight. Paul doesn't hold back telling his brothers and sisters how he feels. And I wanted to mention this at the beginning of our time at People's Church, because, you know, it's awkward when you meet new people. It is, isn't it? And um, if I say to you now, which will, I will say sincerely and truly, I love you <laughs> and Stuart loves you. you know, you have to know that that is coming from faith and it's coming from the love of God. But when you know... When you hear people say, I love you and I value you, does it not make all the difference? When you know, you know, you can come in here because you are loved and you are welcomed and you are valued. That makes all the difference, doesn't it? <laughs> it's what we need to hear every single day. I love you. I want the best for you. We hardly know you, <laughs> but we love you. And we know that God is love. And if we base and ground everything in love, then we are onto a winner, a winner for the kingdom. And Paul encourages us to act out of the love that we have, the love we have for God and the love we have for others, to let love guide and determine our decisions, our judgments, our direction, our speech, our relationships. We don't always get it right, do we? I know for sure I don't. But let love grow. Let love overflow. This is Paul's prayer for the Philippians because he knows the power of the love of God and as it is shared with each other. In verse 9, he prays for the Philippians that they will let their love overflow. And he encourages them to grow in knowledge and understanding, but he doesn't mean book knowledge because Paul's been there. Paul was a Jew and a Pharisee and a student of the scriptures. And he knew it and he had a lot of pride in it. But until he met Jesus on the Damascus road and he experienced the love of God through knowing Jesus Christ, he had no idea that he was on the wrong path. But when he did meet Jesus, he was like, oh, my goodness, the love of God is everything. The love of God is everything. And that's why he prays for the Philippians, build everything on love, build everything on love for God and love for others. And when you do, you'll be able to see what really matters and tell what really matters and do what really matters and think what really matters. How many arguments would be spared if we prioritize being loving rather than being right? I should listen to my own advice. <laughs> <laughs> whether that's in the home, in work, or in the church. Every day we make decisions about what to do, how to treat people, what and whom to prioritize, how to react or respond to difficulties. Let's follow Paul's advice to let our love grow and get deeper and deeper, our knowledge of the love of God and how he wants us to love each other. And then we will be pure and blameless. Do you believe that? Because this is something that Paul says is possible in the church. Don't give in to thinking, oh, churches, oh my goodness. Who would step foot in a church? What a holy mess. Yes, we're all just people. <laughs> but we can choose to love. We can choose to forget what's past and look to Jesus. 
And then we will see the fruit of Jesus in our lives. We can see the fruit of lovelessness. And who would choose that? War, hate, abuse, arguments, resentment, unforgiveness, breakdown. Who would choose that? And yet so often humans do. Am I doing this out of love? If we can answer this question honestly every day in what we do and think, we can be pure and blameless before the throne of God. Is what I am thinking and feeling intend and intending, as well as what I'm doing, bringing praise and glory to God? Because Paul says, this is God's ambition for us, that what we do and what we think and who we are will bring praise and glory to God. So I see two main argument, um, arguments, encouragements in this passage. First, in verse six, the encouragement to trust that God has begun a good work in you. And that God will see you through. And second, in verse nine, the encouragement to pray for yourself and for our church, that our love will grow and grow so that we will know what matters and what is best and be pure and blameless until the day of Christ's return. How do you need encouragement in your faith today or this week? How do you need encouragement to know that God is working in your life and he wants to bring that to completion? He will not let you down. And how can we encourage each other in faith this week? Maybe simply sending a Christian song. I love the songs that we sang. <laughs> Maybe send in a Bible verse. Maybe just texting someone saying, just remember God loves you. And I love you too. And this is what I love and value about you. How beautiful it is to speak these words of love over each other. I'd love us to commit to pray this prayer from verses 9 to 11 every day this week and as many times as you can. To take verses 9 to 11 in this passage and say, I'm going to, pray this for myself, for my loved ones, for my church. I'd love us to be able to come back next Sunday with so many more encouraging stories about how God has encouraged us and how we have encouraged each other. Wouldn't that be beautiful? You guys are already doing it. You're already doing it. There is so much more and there's a whole community out there that needs to be encouraged to with the love of God and the love that we have that can grow and grow and grow because the love of God is infinite and he places that in our hearts to share with the people around us so as the band come up we're going to spend some more time in worship and um Let's take time to respond. You, know, you heard what Stuart said at the beginning, and I love that you're free to do that. So let's just keep going. If you feel like God is speaking to you, then come and share. And hopefully we'll have time <laughs> um, to, to, to hear some of the encouragement that God's given us. But I'd like us on the last screen. Oh, is it possible Jonas to... Hasn't Jonas done an epic job? <laughs> Um, on the last screen is this prayer. Now, this is in the New Living Translation. Your, whatever your Bible is, it's cool. So, But we are going to, I'm going to read it. If you would like to either just pray it quietly or pray it out loud with me, like we did yesterday at the induction. Um, I think it was a race to see who could finish first yesterday. But let us pray this together as we respond to God and listen to how God is speaking to us. I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. For I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. For this will bring much glory and praise to God. Amen.